A submersible with five people on board heading for the wreck of the Titanic has lost contact with its mothership. Nobody knows where it is or, or even whether the crew is still alive. But yesterday afternoon, we got some clues from the U.S. Coast Guard who may have as little as 48 hours left to find a needle in a haystack. It is a uh, remote area, uh, and it is uh, a challenge to conduct a uh, search in that remote area. But we are deploying all available assets to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we can uh, locate uh, the craft and uh, uh, rescue uh, the, the people on board. What do we know about this vessel? Who was on board? Where might search teams find it? And just how challenging a search is this going to be? The submersible is called Titan. It's a small ship, only about 22 feet long, which is tight for five people. One of those people we know is British billionaire, pilot, and explorer Hamish Harding. He had been posting on social media about the trip. Also on board, French diver Paul-Henri Nargelet, Shazada Dawood and his son Suleiman from one of the wealthiest families in Pakistan, and the CEO of the company that runs these expeditions himself, Stockton Rush. Now, seats on board the Titan are expensive. Typically, it's a quarter of a million dollars for the opportunity. Titan launched Sunday morning from a larger ship, about 370 kilometers off the coast of Newfoundland. The interest in the Titanic is the reason we go there. Almost nowhere else in the deep ocean can, can you get funding to go back every year for decades and see how coral reefs develop and see how, uh, how metals decay and see how currents change. Yes, this is a ship designed to bring tourists to the Titanic and in a pretty unconventional way. Taking a completely new approach to the sub-design, and it's all run with this game controller and these touch screens. So if you want to go forward, you press forward. If you want to go back, you go back, turn left, turn right, go down, go up. And it's Bluetooth, so I can hand it to anybody. From what we know, Titan had already made this trip several times this year. But let's be clear here. This is a very remote area, and the ocean floor where the Titanic wreckage is is about 13,000 feet deep. It takes two hours just to go straight down. It, it is not for the faint-hearted to do something like this, to get in that sub. It's, it's very close quarters. You're in it for a long time. You're bolted in from the outside. There's no way out. There's no hatch to get out of it. The problem started about one hour and 45 minutes after the submersible began making its descent. Communication between it and the ship it launched from just cut off, which is really bad because from that moment on, command crews on the surface have no idea whether the crew below needs help, whether they're lost, whether other critical equipment has also failed, or whether the ship itself is even still intact. It's the depth, you know, that's the thing. That's the big factor. You know, to get the submersible back to the surface is the big thing. The pressure when you're that deep underwater is enormous, about 4,000 PSI, pounds per square inch, which, just to put that in perspective, is like having the weight of a car pressing down on every square inch of the ship. According to OceanGate, that's the company that owns the vessel, there are sensors on board that monitor that pressure, making sure the ship doesn't crumple under the weight. That can theoretically give the crew on board enough time to realize if there's a problem and then rise back up to the surface. But that relies on everything running the way it should. The Coast Guard out of Boston is helping search for a missing submarine that was being used to tour the Titanic. Once OceanGate realized something had gone wrong, it reached out to the U.S. Coast Guard, which began organizing a surface search. That means looking above water. At the same time, uh, we launched a C-130 uh, aircraft to search, to conduct an aerial search, uh, both visual and radar of uh, the scene. The Canadian Coast Guard is also helping with two other planes in the sky. But you might wonder, why look for an underwater vessel above water? Well, two reasons. One, remember that all we know is that communication is down. Once that happened, the submersible could have abandoned the mission, rose to the surface, hoping to be found. 
That's the best case scenario. So I've been on numerous searches in, in inshore uh, in a rescue boat. Uh, you know, the energy level is high. The adrenaline is through the roof. Uh, everybody is up on deck and on watch um, using every available piece of equipment and all eyes. So right now I know there's numerous vessels out there. But the second reason why I look on the surface is that the U.S. Coast Guard couldn't really do much else. The only capacity they would have had to look underwater was from the ship that launched the submersible in the first place. I mentioned at the start how this was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Adding to the complexity of this case is uh, the fact that uh, this was a uh, submersible vessel. We're also having to uh, search in the water column. That water column is 13,000 feet deep. But it's worse than that because the Coast Guard can't actually go that far down. It can only listen. And we're doing that right now uh, with the use of uh, sonar buoys and sonar on uh, the uh, ship that's out there to listen for uh, any sounds that uh, we can uh, detect in the water column. As of yesterday, the Coast Guard was expecting other ships to arrive on scene soon, from the Canadian Armed Forces, from the U.S. Navy, even other commercial vessels in the area. Some, the Coast Guard hopes, will have some kind of subsurface capability. But even if you hear something by sonar, even if you could pinpoint their exact location, you might still have to actually go down there and bring them back up. And you're somewhat, uh, you know, at, at the whim of the currents, the undersea currents, which go all the way to the bottom, and they go in different directions depending on the depth you're at. Here's what Oceangate said in a written statement. Our entire focus is on the crew members in the submersible and their families. We are deeply thankful for the extensive assistance we have received from several government agencies and deep sea companies in our efforts to reestablish contact with the submersible. But what they don't acknowledge here is that time may be running out. The submersible only has about 96 hours of emergency oxygen on board. That's four days, with two days already having gone by. If the submersible isn't already at the surface, the best hope here is that it at least would still have motor control, that it could operate under its own power. Well, I'm very optimistic. The technology available today, you know, it's, it's very high tech. Uh, you know, I've been asked, is deep submersible diving safe? I think it's very safe. Um, I dove on a platform you know, 20 years ago, that that platform was used for many years prior to that and dove uh, many times a lot deeper than Titanic. I'm very optimistic that this will come to a, you know, a very happy ending and hopeful that it will. The Coast Guard said to expect more updates, more assets in the water in the coming days. We and the whole world, it seems, will be watching.